Okay. Uh, PS. Is it four? PS four is out. Due at the end of the week. Uh, any questions or problems about that before we go any farther? Yes. Okay, so there's uh, a problem that sometimes shows up on IQ tests, which is, you know, you've got different sizes of jugs that, uh, you know, that can contain water, and the constraint is that uh, you've either got to fill a container completely when you're, they've got water in them to start, and you pour them between containers, and when you pour them, uh, you either have to pour until the container you're pouring into is full or until the container you're pouring out of is empty. And you're supposed to do a series of pours that ends up with a certain amount of water in one of the containers. And I ask you to model that as a graph problem. And so the, the, the reason I give an assignment like that is to, make, is to show you that graph problems don't come labeled all the time as graph problems. You get some problem and you realize you can model it as a graph. So this is practice with modeling a, a, a problem. And you might not have thought of using a graph to model it. So what you have to do is figure out what do the vertices, you know, if you've got a graph, what do the vertices stand for? Uh, what are the edges for? Uh, are the edges weighted? Are the vertices, do the vertices have information? Uh, is it directed, undirected? What algorithm would you use to, to find the solution once you've modeled the situation with a, with a graph? It's hard to say much in, in a lot of detail without giving away the answer. But, uh, you know, just, you know, your first impulse might be to say, okay, each vertex represents a, uh, a container. Well, that's not right. So I'll, I'll tell you that much. I don't know if that helps or not. Better than nothing. <laughs> Barely. Any other questions? Okay. So you remember last Thursday we were, uh, I went through uh, two sets of slides because I wanted to get to the end where it talks about DAG algorithms. And along the way I skipped over some things and said I'd come back and talk about them today. So that's what I'm doing. But before we do that, I want to um, just warm us up by remembering the depth-first search algorithm we were using last time. And in particular, this is an application of depth-first search to assign pre- and post-visit numbers to each vertex. So you should remember, or hopefully you remember, that depth-first search is based on the explore algorithm. So on a connected graph, on a directed, undirected graph like this, what does the explore algorithm do? You give, it a, you give it a graph and you give it a starting vertex. What does explore do? Which vertices does it visit? So don't worry right now about the, the pre-visit and the post-visit. Just look at that. Which, this, is a, this is an array indexed by vertex number. It becomes true when you have visited a vertex. So if you start exploring at a given vertex, which vertices are marked as visited? Yeah? The vertices are on, and then it goes to the ones it's connected to. Okay, so the vertex you're on is marked as visited. As you can see, we call G on V. V is marked visited right away. So let's say we started on, uh, on B up here. V would be marked visited. When explore returns, when that call to explore returns, what other vertices will have been marked visited? Yeah? So everything that connects to B. Everything that connects. In what sense do you mean connect? Like a, everything that there's a path. Okay. To so so every, 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 if there's a way to get from B to some other vertex, that other vertex will be marked as visited. So if there's a path. So A, B, D, C, E, everything in that clump is going to be marked as visited. So that's what Explore does on an undirected graph. Uh, 
And in, in fact, it does that on a directed grip. It's just that the arrows have, the, the edges have directions, and you got to pay attention to the directions. So everything that's reachable is, is marked visible. So if you call explore on A, that whole clump gets visited. If you call explore on F, that clump, F and G, gets visited. So what's the difference between explore and depth first search? Yep. Depth first search, are you looking for something specific? No, we're not. Depth first search, we're not looking. Well, you can modify depth first search to look for something. But the way it's written up here, we're not looking for something specific. So how is it different? Yeah. Depth first search won't go from E to D, right? It'll go back up to A and then go to D. Well, if you start from A, the, you'll go from A to B to D and then maybe then to E and D. So it's not the order in which things are visited I'm focusing on here. Yeah. Uh, depth first search goes through all the clumps, whereas explore only goes one clump at a time. OK. Explore just explores the clump to which a vertex belongs. Depth first search visits every clump. So depth first explore systematically visits every vertex in a clump. Depth first search systematically uh, visits every vertex in a tree. It does by, that by looking at each clump. So you see what depth first search does is marks all the vertices visited as, as false, visited as unvisited. And then for each vertex, if it has not been visited, it calls explore. So first thing in the middle, let's say it's working after the order in this loop here. So it'll see that A is unvisited. So it'll call explore on A. And when, it, when explore returns, all of that clump that A belongs to will be marked visited. What happens next? This loop will keep spinning. It'll say, okay, has B been visited? Well, yeah, it has, because it was visited when we visited A. Has C been visited? D, E, is, and then it'll find F. Well, F has not been visited, so it'll call explore on F. That'll do its thing, visit F and G, mark them visited. And then uh, this loop ends and we return. So we've systematically, depth first search deals with the clumps. It calls explore, how many times does depth first search call explore? For that graph twice, in general, how, what would be the answer? Yeah, once per clump. If we're, we're, clump is really only meaningful if we're talking about an undirected graph. So an undirected graph, it calls once per clump. And then Explorer takes care of the clumps. Now, what's depth first about it? Why are we saying depth first? Let's just have to do a depth. That's sort of getting at it, but there's a. It's because for every branch you can go, you only go all the way down to that branch. Okay, so we, starting at A, we explore all the way down a branch before we try a different direction out of, out of A. So we start at A, we go to B, and once we get to B, we don't back up and go to D. That would sort of be breadth first. If we went visited A and then B and then D, instead we just forge ahead. We go from A to B and we keep going deeper. And uh, we visit C and E and D. By the time we get back to A, everything's been visited. So it just has to do with the order in which vertices are, done, are, are visited. Now, as we do this, each time Explore is called, uh, that means it's the first time we visit a vertex. And so we record the time at which we, which we first encounter that vertex. That's the pre number here. And we just set the pre number for that vertex to, to the clock value and increment. And then, when we're all done exploring all directions out of the <coughs> vertex, uh, after this loop ends, we post-visit it and record the time at which we were finished. And those pre and post times uh, are a big reason that we're interested in depth first search. Doing depth first search most of the time just to compute those pre and post times to do something else with them. For example, in the caddis problem this week, first thing you're going to want to do is take the graph and uh, compute the pre and post times so that you can then run a DAG algorithm on the graph. So let's remember how pre and post times work. 
So it, whenever I ask you to give you a problem on a, on a problem set, I give you a problem on an exam and ask you to give the pre and post numbers that will result when the algorithm is run. There are all these arbitrary choices the algorithm has to make. For example, it, it says here, for each V, for each vertex, do something. Well, it's not specified in which order the vertices are considered. Right? They can be considered in any order. Uh, and so on these problems, I will specify. I will say, okay, anytime there's an arbitrary choice to be made, uh, do it in alphabetical order or reverse alphabetical order or something like that. So you be sure to pay attention to that because that's what makes the answer unique. So for this one, we're going to always choose, if we've got to choose between two vertices to do first, we're going to choose the one that comes first in the alphabet. Okay, so we, uh, we go into DFS, we set the clock to one, we mark everything unvisited, and then for each vertex in V, if it's not visited, we call explore. Okay, so what's the first vertex we're gonna consider? A, because it comes first. We could, we could, that loop right there in DFS could start with A, F, D, C, E, F, G, it doesn't matter. Still be depth for a search, but we're gonna since we got to choose from all those, we'll we'll pick an alphabetical order. So we'll start with A, and so we call Explore of A, and uh, that yellow we're marking it visited, and its pre number is one. Okay, so we've entered Explore, mark it yellow, recorded the pre visit number, and now we're going to iterate through every, basically for, uh, every edge of this form. Now sometimes this notation confuses students. V is known. So right here, we're asking for every edge of the form A, comma, U. So every edge that goes from A to something. And we're not asking for, we're not iterating over every edge in the set of edges. We're, ask, we're iterating through every edge in the set of edges that starts with the value of V, which is A in this case. So what edges are going to be iterated over in this loop? What values of U will we find? Yeah, B and V. And we'll consider B first, just because of my alphabetical rule. Okay? There's, you know, we're not saying what order we should consider the edges out of A, but we're doing mathematical order. So we find B. B is not visited, so we explore. So what happens when we explore B? Marked as visited. And what was pre-number B? Two. Okay. Now we're in explore of this thing. And we've got to consider uh, there are three edges out of this. Uh, there's an edge to A, an edge to C, an edge to E. We'll consider the edge to A first, but that's A's already been visited, so we finish with that quickly. What will happen next? C is unvisited, so we'll explore it. So now we're three levels deep in the recursion. It's marked visited, pre-visit of three. Now it's going to consider the one edge out of it, which is to B, but that's been visited. So nothing happens, so the loop ends. Remember, we're three levels deep in the recursion. The recursion for C, the loop is over. We call post visit on C, and what number does it get? Four. And it returns. Now we're two levels deep in the recursion. A and then B on top of the stack. B is trying, you know, we're in the middle of B's loop, so where's, what's B going to look at next? E. So it's visited. It gets the pre number of five. Okay, now we're three levels deep. E starts iterating and tries to go to B, but that's visited, and it tries to go to D, that's unvisited, so it makes a recursive call to explore. Now we're four levels deep, pre number of six. D is going to try to go to A and to E. Neither of those work out, so we're done with this recursion, and so we give it a post number of what? Seven. Now E is done. Now B is done. And A is done. And at that point, we return from Explore back up to DFS. DFS is in the middle of iterating through all the vertices. So it just considered A. Now it's considered B, but that's been visited. C, B, E, F. F's unvisited, so it calls Explore of F, which gets marked visited and has a pre number of 11 now. It'll explore down to G, which gets to 12. Post number's 13. We return to post number's 14. That returns to DFS. DFS is, everything's been visited, so it's finished. So that's depth for a search. That's the, uh, 
uh, pre and post numbering. And you'll need to do something like this just to get going on the CADIS problem this week, to compute the pre and post numbers. Any questions about that? Well, let's talk about the CADIS problem just for a second. So here, I've, I've labeled the uh, vertices with letters. And uh, I'm just imagining that we have the, uh, we have an array that can be indexed with letters. You're going to have vertices labeled with strings, arbitrary strings. So what kind of, how will you implement the visited array? Because you, can, you can't index into an array with a string, so what will you do? A map, right? So, uh, or in this case, visit doesn't even have to be a map, it would be simpler. If you have a map that just maps to true or false, what could you replace the map with? A set. A set. So like a hash set of strings can be visible. You know, if it's in the set, it's been visited. If it's not in the set, it's not been visited. Okay? Uh, you're going to have to record pre and post visit numbers, perhaps. You, you can probably you can find a way to get away, you can get around without doing it. But let's suppose you wanted to store the pre and the post numbers. What would that be? A map. A map from strings to ints. Store the pre and post number. What about the graph itself? You want to you're going to want to use an adjacency matrix. No. You're going to want to use a, a uh, adjacency list, I should say. It's, it's not a, it's not a dense graph you're dealing with. So um, how will that work? Okay, normally, when we assume that the vertices are labeled with, with integers, your adjacency list looks like here. There's an entry for each vertex, you know, it vertex 0, vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, and so on. And then down here, there's some sort of list storing vertex numbers like 2, 5, 7. Right? What are you going to do when the vertex numbers are, are actually strings? Use a map with the list or a set. Right. That has to be a map. And it has to map strings to this thing. And what is this thing here? A list of strings. And that works here because the, in, in Caddis, there, no, there's nothing, there are no weights on the edges, so it's an unweighted graph. So it, anywhere you see array, you're going to be thinking map. Or, okay? All right, so we looked at several uses of depth for research. This was the last use we looked at to get the pre and the post numbers. Now, let's analyze its complexity. So we just got to count operations to get the complexity. Uh, so let's start with def first search up there. We've got that first loop up there for each V in V. Remember, capital V is the set of all vertices. We have to set visit of V to false. Okay, so let's start with that. What's the complexity of that loop? Yeah. That's not working. O of V. So remember, we're letting capital V stand for the set of all vertices. We're also letting it stand for the size of the set of all vertices. So in this case, O of V means the V stands for the size of the set. So the amount of work you have to do to initialize visited is proportional to the size of that set. Right? Now we've got, um, what do we do next? We've got this loop here. And I've got this problem. Uh, okay, I, I know iterating through this set V, we're going to do, we're going to go, we're going to go through the loop once for each vertex. So that's of size capital V. And the cost of this check right here is constant. But what's the cost of this call to explore going to be? 
Sometimes we call Explorer, sometimes we don't. We don't even know how many times Explorer is called. Yeah. Is it the, the number of vertices that you can reach to without going through the count vertex? Yeah, so we're, yeah, we're going to call the, the call of Explorer, that's going to happen some number of times, and that time is equal to the number of clumps. But all I know is this graph has V vertices and E edges. I don't know how many clumps it has. I, that's not, that's, there's no constant for that. There's no variable for that. So we could just assume the worst. We could assume Explorer is called V times. But that's going to end up causing an overestimate because we may come down here and decide this Explorer could be called V times as well. We end up with some massive overestimate. So I'm going to do a slightly different strategy. What's just the, forget about the call to Explorer for right now. What's the cost of that loop if you ignore the call to Explorer? Yeah, that's another V. Okay. Okay, now, so we've got, uh, we've got the, the cost of the first loop and the cost of the second loop exclusive of the call to Explorer. Now, over the life of this entire thing, you call DFS and it calls Explore some number of times, and Explore calls Explore recursively some number of times. How many times over the entire life of one call to DFS is Explore called? V times. So how do you know that? How do we know it's called V times? Yeah? Is it because uh, at the end of it, everything is going to be second visited? And only if this were visited as such, it was going to explore. OK, so we said at the end, uh, everything is set to visit. And the only place that can happen is in a call to explore. That's one way to look at it. Another is, is just to say that explore is called once per vertex. Right? You don't call it unless it hasn't been visited. So it's called once per vertex, and there are V vertices. So over the cost of uh, one call to DFS, we end up with um, V calls to explore. And that means that that's going to happen V times. Right? Only it happens, this happens once per call to explore. But explore is called V times. Now, some of those calls to explore will be from up here. And some will be from down here. But still, we've accounted for all the work except the work for Explore. We know Explore be called V times, and, uh, and so this state will be executed V times. So that's O of V. What's the cost of that call to pre-visit? Over, over the entire algorithm. Yeah, say pre-visit runs in constant time. So that's O of V again. Okay. Now, what do we do with this loop down here? So we hit this spot. Any, any call to explore, we know what V is. And we're just trying to match U against edges so that VU is an edge. So how many times will this loop run? What's the most it can run? Yep. But most, this can run E times, each call to explore. What's another bound you could put on that? Well, yeah, E is no bigger than V squared. I claim, though, this loop can run at most V times. V is also a bound on the number of times that loop can run in any call to explore. Why is that? Yeah? It can only be that many edges from that to that node. Right. You can only have one edge from a vertex to any other vertex. So the most edges that can leave a vertex is V. The most edges that can leave a vertex is also E. So whichever of those is smaller gives you the bound. However, this is another place where it's easy to overestimate. It can't be the case. In, in, in every case, it's not going to be that every time you call explore, you generate E edges out of this thing, or V edges out of this thing. 
Because you, that way you could end up with like v times e. Total times this loop is executed. There can't be that many edges in a graph. The graph is dense. The point is, sometimes this loop will only run a few times. Sometimes it might run a lot. But over the entire course of every call to explore, what's the bound on the number of total times? If you count how many times it executes when you call explore on A and the number of times you call explore on B and C, what's the bound on the number of times that loop can run if you add them all up? And remember, this is computing the first time you call it. If you call it, if B is A, you're asking for all the edges out of A. It iterates once for every, every edge out of A. Then it will run once for every edge out of B. And then once for every edge out of C, and so on. So what's the, what's the bound on the total number of times that loop can run over all calls to explore? Yeah? It just be E. E, yeah. There is a good, a good bound. It's called once per edge. Now, really, it's 2e because we explore the edge in both directions. But uh, it doesn't matter. We're doing a big, a big O bound either way. So maybe it runs uh, twice for A and three times for B and so on. But if you add all those up, you're going to get 2e. We'll just call that e. All right. So we're entering this loop e times. Um, so what's the cost? Over the entire algorithm, over all the calls to explore, how much will that uh, call to visit in the view cost? It's a constant time operation. How many times will it be executed? What's that? Yeah? V uh, times? Um, or over the entire depth first search or explore? Over the entire depth first search. We already decided this loop runs V e times. Well, just E. Okay, V times E is an overestimate. We know that over there's going to be V calls to explore. Each time we call explore, this loop will run some number of times. If you add all those times up, it'll add up to two E, which we'll call E, and that's just constant time. So that visited viewer has an O of E cost over the entire life of the algorithm. So let's. Um, Okay, so there it is. O of E is the, uh, you know, we call visited once per edge. And then we got to call explore here and here. So there's some calls to calling explore, exclusive of what explore does, just setting up for their call. You know, pushing a stack for it and initializing it. That happens V times. So that's where that O of E comes from. Some of those calls to explore happen here, some of them happen here. So all that's undefined up here is the cost of enumerating all the edges. Because there's some cost in identifying all the edges that, uh, that uh, that come out of the vertex. So what does that cost? <coughs> well, let's push. Let's let's come back to that. Let's add everything up. Oh, well, post visit we call v times. I forgot about that one. So we add all those things up. We get O of V plus O of E plus whatever the cost of numerating all the edges is. There's some data structure we got to go into to find the edges. We didn't really account for that cost. We accounted for everything else. We didn't account for that. So let's stop here. Let's not worry about the cost of numerating all the edges. Let me see if there are any questions I could answer about where any of this other stuff came from. This is the most complicated analysis we've done because we had to count pretty carefully to avoid overcounting. If you assume the worst case everywhere, if you assume, okay, at worst it'll call explore v times right here, and at worst it'll call explore v times here, and you end up with like v times e or e squared or something like that. So we were careful to say, okay, I don't know exactly how many times we'll call explore from here or from here, but the total number, number of times it's called is V over the entire algorithm. Same thing. I don't know how long this loop will run on any particular call to explore, but over, if you add up all the calls to explore, this loop will go around E times. So that's where the V, the V's and E's are coming from. But the one thing, so let me see if, if having said that, any, any questions I could help with this? Okay. 
cost of enumeration. You've got some data structure, either an adjacency matrix or adjacency list that you're dealing with. So let's say you have a JC matrix. And, and we're, we're, we, this four inch loop is saying, okay, give me every edge out of A. What's that gonna cost? What's it gonna cost? Even if there are no edges out of A, what's the cost of finding all the edges out of A if you got a matrix? V. You gotta go along one row of the matrix to find everything out of A. So if you're using a JC matrix, it's easy. Every time through this loop, you're doing O of V work just to find the edges, regardless of what you do with the edges, or regardless how many edges you find. And uh, how many times are you doing that? And once for each vertex, you're finding all the edges out of the vertex once. So V, it's V work each time, and there's V, v vertices, so V squared. It's V squared work to extract all the edges out of the JC matrix. Now why does that make sense? that the amount of work to, a, to extract all the edges out of, out of a matrix is going to be V squared. What are you saying? Got to go through the entire matrix. Right. You got to look at it. You got to look at the entire matrix to find all the edges. And the matrix is already V squared big. Okay? Now, what if you have an adjacency list? How much will finding all the, ver all the edges out of A cost? I have a JC matrix here, JC list. So we got this. We, let's say we've got uh, some list here, maybe nothing there, maybe something short there. So let's let that first one be A. What would be the cost of finding all the edges out of A? Well, it's no bigger than V. But it would be an overestimate to say, okay, it's going to take V work to find all the edges out of vertex zero, and V work to find all the edges out of vertex one, and V work to find all the edges out of vertex two. Because we never have, none of those lists are that long. So what does the, what does the cost of finding all the edges out of vertex zero depend on? The number of edges out of zero. So really, the work is going to depend upon, first of all, there's, you, you, there's at least constant time, because you've got to at least look at the entry up there, even if it's null. So even finding the edges out of that last thing is going to be constant time, because you've got to check that it's null. But the amount of work is going to vary from vertex. Some vertices, you do a lot of work to find the edges, because the list is long. Other times, the list is short. Not much work to do. So let's just add it all up over the entire life of the algorithm, finding all the edges out of, out, out of every vertex, what's the total cost going to be of identifying the edges out, uh, in the graph? Number of edges. Well, have got a proposal that it's equal to the number of edges. Okay? That's not right because what if the graph were empty and there were no edges? You still got to look at every entry in that spine up there to make sure that there are no edges. So that's close. Yeah. Well, V plus E. Yeah. Right. You, the, the number of entries in this thing is E. Right. These, the total length of all this list is your E. You got to look at everything in every list. That's E. And then you got to look at every entry in that array up there, and that's V. V plus E. And again, that's the size of the data structure. So the analysis of depth first search depends on what representation you're using for the graph. So for a matrix, it's O of E plus O of E. You got this here, O of E plus O of E plus the cost of enumerating the edges, that's your V squared. And how do I, first of all, how do I turn a bunch of O of E's and an O of E into one O of E and one O of E? Where that simplification come from? Just getting from up here to down here. <coughs> yeah. So out of all the O of E's, there's six of them. That's just a leading constant. So we got O of E plus O of E. How do we get this simplification? First of all, why does O of E go away? 
Yeah. V squared just dominates uh, O of V. Yeah, o that's a lower term. So let's get rid of that. Where does the O of E go away, though? is O of V squared. E can't be bigger than V squared. So we just leave it as V squared. So on a matrix, the cost of depth for a search is O of V squared. Okay? Can you imagine an algorithm that would do better? Or I'll put it another way. Convince us that no algorithm could do better. It's a simple argument that says that this algorithm is optimal in the big O sense. You, you, you could not find an algorithm that could run any faster. Yep. You can't not go through everything. Yeah, you've got to at least look at every element in the, in the matrix. And that takes V squared time right there. Okay, for a adjacency list, it is O of E plus O of E again, plus the cost of enumerating, which is O of E plus E. That simplifies to O of E plus E. And again, that's as good as you can do, because that's the size of the data structure. So you will see that first search called a linear algorithm, which looks kind of weird when you see that V squared term. What's linear about depth first search? Yeah? Well, if you, well, the thing is, if you have twice as many vertices on the matrix, you're going to end up with a quadruple in your running time. That doesn't sound, that sounds quadratic. Yeah? Linear with respect to edges? Well, is it linear with respect to the edges? I don't want to say that either. There's a, there's a that's, that's closer, but there's another way I want to put it. Yeah? If you're per performing some other computation per vertex, then it'll uh, perform once per vertex. Well, that's true as well. Uh, but different point, I guess I'm, you're not going to guess what I have in mind, so I'll just tell you. <laughs> it's, it's linear in the size of the representation in the graph. If your graph representation takes 1,000 bytes, and you increase it so your graph representation takes 2,000 bytes, and depth per search running time is going to double. So it's linear in the size of the representation. And you can see that here. The time is directly proportional to the size of the representation in the case of the matrix and to the size of the representation in the size of the list. So it's kind of weird. We're not talking about the size of the graph itself. We're talking about the size of the thing that represents it. But it's, it's linear in that sense. Yeah? So if we happen to use the list for a dense graph in the list case, we'd still end up with it. Oh, V squared, because the number of edges would be V squared. Yes, so if, you, if you, you, you're using an adjacency list that happened to be dense and have V squared edges, then this would be O of V plus E. E would be V squared in that case, and, you, and that would simplify the V squared. So it would be V squared either way. That's not to say that you should always, that you should use an adjacency list for a, to represent a matrix, because a matrix could be much more, to represent a dense graph, because a matrix can be much denser, okay, take less space. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is depth first search is efficient. It's as good as we can do, these two representations. Any last questions about it? Okay, let's take a break and, um, and we'll see what we skipped over on the other set of slides.
fix this. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I was looking at like a uh, quiz free food and I realized that uh, the fast multiply, I had the parameters. Hold on a sec. All right, now we also talked about differential directed graphs. So the examples we saw before were about undirected graphs, this time directed graphs. And it's the same algorithm. It's just that, well, I have nothing more to say. It's the same algorithm. But you can, when you do it on a directed graph, you can use the pre and post numbers for some, uh, to identify properties of the edges. And th those properties are only interesting on, on directed graphs. So let's do the depth first search here on directed graphs. Uh, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna color, we color that yellow for being visited. He gets the pre number of one. And I'm gonna use the colors differently. You may, you saw this example last time, but uh, yellow means we're considering the edge and, and that edge works out because it goes to an unvisited vertex. So we, we're coloring it black to mean that we actually use the edge. So then we're, uh, we're gonna color it two. We're gonna give it the pre-time, the, the pre-visit time of two. Where will we look next? We'll look at C and that works out. So actually, you know, I'm not using yellow for visited, I'm using yellow for current active vertex. How can you tell if a vertex has been visited with this animation? It has a pre number. Okay, so that gets the three. There's nowhere to go out of C, so we back up, we give it a post time of four and back up to B. Then we're gonna consider the only other th option is to go to E. So E works out, and I forgot to change the, you know, on the animation there. That gets a five. Uh, we try to go to C. What's going to happen there? Been there before, so we, I'm going to color that orange, meaning we didn't use it. Now we're going to consider going to E. That's good. That gets a six. Now we'll consider going to B. That's a fail. 
we're done. So D gets the seven. We're back to E. We've exhausted all the options out of E, so that gets the eight. We back up to B. We're always backing up along the black edges. Uh, B, nowhere to go. So that gets a nine. And now we're back to A. And what happens there? We'll try to go to D. That's a fail. So we get the 10. Now what happens? You know, it's, DFS is going to find another unexplored place, either F or G. It'll see F first. So that gets the 11. It goes down to G. That gets the 12. And the tries to go to E, that doesn't work out. 13, 14, and we're done. So when you do a depth first search on a directed graph, you end up with the black edges, which are called tree edges. And then, because they sort of form the tree you actually follow, and then the orange edges are um, not the tree edges. Okay. So the black edges are part of the search tree. Those are the tree edges. Three names for the orange edges, three different kinds of orange edges. First of all, if an orange edge goes to an ancestor in the tree, it's a back edge. We call it a back edge. So where's a back edge? Which of these orange edges is a back edge? It goes from a vertex to an ancestor in the tree. So like a vertex to a parent or a grandparent. D to B is the back edge because it goes, uh, you know, D is a grandchild of B. You've got black edges that go B, E, D, and then an edge back. And so uh, that's a back edge. Sometimes these orange edges go to a descendant in the tree, and then they're called forward edges. So it's sort of the opposite of the back edge. So what's an example here of a, uh, of a forward edge? Yeah, A to D is a forward edge, because A, B, E, D. D is a great-grandchild of A, and there's an edge from A to D, so that's a forward edge. And the others we call cross edges, the leftover ones. So there we have it. Now, is the fact that A, that a to B is a tree edge and that A to D is a forward edge, is that a property of the graph? In other words, if I showed you this graph before we started, was A to D destined to be a forward edge? No. Right. It's not. What does it depend on? It's not just a property of the graph. Your ordering? Yeah, the order in which we do things. So if I say, okay, here's a graph, and we're going to do depth first search, and we're always going to make arbitrary choices in alphabetical order, then, yes, A to D is destined to be a forward edge. But typically, that's not specified. So it just depends on the particular search you do. It determines what the forward and the back edges are and the cross edges and everything. Now, it turns out that after you've done a search, you don't have to color the edges as you're doing them, for the most part. You can identify what type of edge you're dealing with just by looking at how the pre and the post numbers compare. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. So these... Uh, Left square bracket stands for a pre number, and the right square bracket stands for a post number. And think of this as time increasing from left to right. So this pattern is saying, okay, U, has, U got its pre time, and then V got its pre time, and then V got its post time, and then U got its post time. And then just based on that pattern, you can say what type of edge U to v, UV is, the edge from U to V, what kind of edge it is. So look at the, look at the numbers up there. Where's a place where that pattern occurs? Where there's an edge from U to V where the pre and post times fall in that pattern. Yeah, A to B. A got its pre time, that's one, and then B got its pre time, that's two. B got its post time, A got its post time. So that's, is that true of every black edge? Why does it have to be true of a black edge? Because when you, right, let's say you go from B to C. Well, B is going to have a, a pre-time. It doesn't have a post-time yet. 
we're going to completely finish with C before we go back to B. And so they have to be nested that way. Sort of the pre and post times of C are nested inside the pre and post times of B. Is it true for any other type of edge? Is it true for all the black edges? Is it true for any of the, of the uh, orange edges? The forward edge has the same property. So tree and forward edges have that pattern always. So you would, if you're trying to classify the edges, you would have to, to tell the difference between tree and forward edges, you'd have to keep a bit somewhere to say if it, something was a tree edge or not. Okay? Uh, what about the second pattern? So remember, the edge is from U to V. It's directed edge from U to V, but V, uh, v gets its pre-edge, its, its pre-time first, before U does. And then U's times are nested inside of V. Where do you see that? Let me look at the orange edges and look for that pattern. So the destination vertex has the earliest pre-time. Well, let's see, the cross edge, no, the cross edge isn't like that. If you look at this one from G to E, uh, yeah, E gets the it's pre-time first, but its post-time comes before G's pre-time happens at all. That's this pattern, that last pattern. So that just leaves back edges. Look at that back edge from D to B. You see that pattern? where D's pre and post times fit in between B's pre and post times. So we're, we're at this, uh, this second pattern. So that, if you see that pattern, you know you have a back edge. And otherwise you have a cross edge. So that's something else you can do with pre and post times. You can classify these things. Now, back edges are particularly interesting. Back edges are really the ones you want to detect. What if you find the back edge? What do you know? You have a cycle. So if you want to test a graph, direct a graph to see if it has a cycle, you just do a depth first search and see if there are any back edges. Now, you really don't have to do the pre and post time business to even find the back edge. How could you detect the back edge without, as you're doing the depth first search, without worrying about the pre and post times? Well, I, I take that back. Let's, let's keep the pre and the post times. How would you know in the heat of the moment that you just uh, you, you've just traversed a back edge? Yeah? If that edge goes to a node that's in the hooded area. Okay, he said if the node goes to a, a ver to, if the edge goes to a vertex been visited already. That's not quite right. Okay, uh, that forward edge from A to D will be when we follow it during the depth first search. That goes to a, a, a D has already been visited, but there's that's not a back edge. Yeah. So if it visits an earlier node with the uh, pre times. Okay, if it go if you follow an edge to something with an earlier pre time. Yes. Well, what about the edge from G to E? No, no, you're right. We're going from to a to an earlier pre time. Yeah. Okay, it's if you if you if you visit a, if you try to go to a vertex and it's been visited and has a pre time, but not a post time yet, that's a back edge. So when we're doing the depth first search, when we went from D to B, uh, D B already had a pre time of two, but did not have its, its post time yet. That tells you that, that you that you've just closed a loop. So if you ever find a, a vertex with a pre time and no post time. As you're searching, you know that, you've, that you, there's a cycle in a directed graph. And this just talks, that, talks about that. So uh, this is what we just talked about. Directed graph G has a cycle if and only if a depth first search reveals a back edge. And this, this proof here is another way of, of saying the same thing. I'm not going to dwell on it. Now, if there are no cycles, it's called a directed acyclic graph. So uh, this thing has a cycle. No, it doesn't. What happened? I, I turned this edge around to make it not a cycle. Same, it looks the same, but this edge is pointing a different way. And we talked about what DAGs are for. 
And what we found was that, or at least what I asserted is, if you want to have an algorithm on a DAG, you very often want to start with topological sort. You want to find uh, uh, the top, you want to put it in topological order. And what was our algorithm for topologically sorting a DAG? Yes? Using the post times from depth first search? Yeah, using the post times from depth first search. So just to remind you, let's do a a depth first search on, well, this is just, okay, we'll do a depth first search and we're just, uh, I think I'm doing reverse alphabetical order here. So G gets the one. We've done enough of these now, I'm going to go through it fast. So we just did some order. We ended up with that depth first search. And if you look at the post times and you go into descending order of post times, you get topological order. So you get A, D, B, E has the 8, then C has the 7, and then G, and then F. There it is. What's significant about the topological order, or the linearized order of a DAG? Why is that important? What does it tell you that A comes before D in the, in the uh, linearization? Yeah? So anything to the right of A, there's no way to get back to A from it. So you cannot get from D to A. You cannot get from B to A. In fact, A, if it, if it comes first, it's a source. There's no, there can be no edges into it. If it comes last, it has to be a sink. There can't be any edges out of it, because the edges would lead to earlier, which isn't allowed. Okay? So uh, that's one way to do a topological sort. What would be another way to sort the same graph? No, what would be another outcome, depending on arbitrary choices you make during the depth first search? A always has to come first. Does D always have to come second? Yeah? So A, D, B, E, you're kind of, there's no way around that. But what could come after A, D, B, E? G, F, C. Right? G could come, but G and C are independent of each other. C could come last since it's a sink. So you could do GFC or you could do GCF. Just has to be a result where there are no edges. If you were to draw the edges into this linearization here, all the edges would go to the right. Uh, and so these are the, those, here's, here's another, this is alphabetical order. Oops. No. And you get a different result. It doesn't want me to go back. Yeah, you get a different result. Okay, and top complexity topological sort is just a depth first search. It, it looks like it would be a depth first search followed by a merge sort, which would make it uh, that. But you really don't have to do the merge sort. Um, you can just record the post times. And in fact, as you record the post time, you can just copy the vertex into an array. You don't have it. Yeah? Do directed acyclic graphs have to be completely connected? Like, uh, or can you have? No, they can be disconnected. You can have a, 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 a DAG that consists of a bunch of vertices and no edges. And then any permutation of the vertices would be a topological sort. All right, so what this slide is saying is. Yeah, it looks like you'd have to do the sort, get the post time, uh, do the search, get the post times, and do a sort. And you'd end up with uh, V log V just for the sort. But you don't really have to do a sort because, you know, if we, let's go back here. So we do the search, we, and, and we, we wake up and pay attention when we get, a, okay, we just got a post time. So suppose we're trying to create a list of the vertices in reverse order of post times. Where should we put the C? At the end of the list. Make it the last element in the list. Keep going. Where should we put F? Next to last. Right before the C. 
Put the G right before that, and you work your way back to the beginning. Then E goes in, B goes in, D goes in, A goes in. So as you're searching, you can just build the graph, the, build the list backwards. You don't have to get the numbers and then sort. So uh, topological sort is no more uh, no more complex than depth first search. Here's another way to, to linearize, to topologically sort, and that is find a source, output it, delete it, and repeat. So what's a source here? How can you tell that A is a source? No edges in. So get rid of it. Now what's a source? Now what's a source? Okay, now you got two choices, C or G. They're both sources. doesn't matter which you pick. Now there are two sources, C and F. So that's another way to do it. Either way, you get the, them in the, in the order of the dependencies. OK. Now, algorithms on DAGs most often are organized in one of these ways. You sort the DAG and then do a, apply a computation to each vertex in sorted order. Or you sort the DAG and do a computation on each vertex in reverse sort order. And I said this last time, I'll say it today, I'll say it Thursday, and I'll be uh, saying it to people next week. Students just all just want to ignore this advice. And they create overcomplicated, inefficient algorithms on DAGs. The most common thing is they uh, skip the topological sort, just write a recursive algorithm to compute some uh, for an algorithm on a DAG and end up with something that takes exponential time. So last week when I saw Galaxy Quest and I saw people running out of time, I knew they ignored one piece of advice I gave. What was that? Don't, and I said you don't have time to group the stars in the galaxies. And people tested that and found out they didn't have time to uh, <laughs> sort the galaxies. And um, when I see it this week, I'll know that they one reason may be that they ignored my advice about doing the topological sort. Now we talked about a couple examples. I want to skip. Let's do this one here. All right. I want to compute the number of paths leading from a source to a vertex, from any source to a vertex. So how many paths are there? How many are the ways it Starting at a source, there's only one source in this case, A, how many ways are there to get to E? How many different driving routes are there to get from A to E? It says three, but what are they? You can go A, B, E, that's one of them. A, D, E, that's two. A, D, B, E, that's three. Okay? There's only one way to get, if it's a source, you know there's only one way to drive there. You have to start there. Uh, there's only two ways to get to B. You can go A to B or A, D, B. What about F down here or, or G? How are there six ways to get there? So basically, we know there's three ways to get to E. And for each of those ways, you can either go straight to G or you can go via C. So that gives you the six. And the, the challenge is to compute this. So you have to look at this and make an observation. What's the relationship? You look at the solution here. What's the relationship between the six that's here and the, uh, and the six that's there? Or let's back up. What's the relationship between the two that's there and the one that's there and the one that's there? Yeah. It's the sum. So if, if, there's two, if there's two predecessors in the graph for B here, and there's one way to get to A and one way to get to D, then there's going to be two ways to get to B. You just add them up. You can either come in this direction or in that direction. Same thing down here. There's, there's two ways to get to B, and then you can come to E, or there's 
one way to get to D, and you can come directly to E, so add them up. 2 plus 1 is 3. So the, the really creative part of designing a DAG algorithm is realizing, okay, what I've got to do to find out the number that's associated with G is I've got to find the, the numbers associated with each predecessor, which is just C and E, the direct predecessor in the graph, and add them up, and that's my number. See, F has one predecessor, so we just, we just copy it. E has two, so we add the two and the one, we get three. G has two, we add the three and three to get six. You realize that. And then that, the rest is easy. Okay? So what will be the algorithm? First of all, what's the, why is it slightly more difficult than just saying, okay, we just get the number of ways to, number of paths for each of our predecessors and add them up? What if you wrote your algorithm that way? What's that? You don't necessarily know your predecessors. Okay, for, you got two problems. One is you've got to be able to identify your predecessor, and the graph's not optimized for that. The graph tells you successors, not predecessors. So it turns out we're going to need to reverse the graph. Just go in the graph and flip all the edges around so we have both versions so we can easily find the predecessors. So then we just write, uh, write an algorithm that loops through the vertices in some order and adds up the, uh, the predecessor uh, answers to get our answer. What would go wrong if we did that? Yeah? You need to do it in a topological order. Okay, what happens if you don't do it in a topological order? The previous ones wouldn't necessarily be already computed. Right. The previous ones wouldn't be necessarily already computed. So let's suppose we start, we, for whatever reason, we decide let's compute the answer for G first. And we say, great, all I gotta do is go compute the answer for C and compute the answer for E and add them up. Or let me, let me I said it the wrong way. We just get the answer for C and get the answer for E and add them up. We look up the answer for C and we look up the answer for E and add them up. But what if they're not already computed? What do we do? Okay? Now, one thing you can say is, okay, we recursively compute the answers, and I'll come back to that suggestion. But what's a simpler way? Let's, you know, I know a lot of you like to avoid recursion. This is a place you avoid recursion. <laughs> if only we could identify the right order in which to calculate these things so that when it came time to calculate G's number, C and E would already be calculated. And when it came time to calculate B, A and B would already be calculated. What order do we do it in? Topological order. We start with the sources and work to the sinks. You compute the answer for A first, and then B, and then when you go to do B, the two numbers you need are already computed. That's, what, that's the importance of topological order, is to get things so that they're computed before you need them. And that works great on the DAG because there are no cycles. If there are cycles, you've got a problem. So that's our, this is the, the thing. If B is a source, the answer is 1. And otherwise, it's the sum of the answer you calculated for all the predecessors. So it's just a loop. You just loop over the predecessors and add up halves of B for each of those. So this is not, not recursive. It's just a lookup. We just look up a path. The, the number of paths for, that we had previously calculated, and it's, we know it's been previously calculated because we're doing it in topological order. That's the magic of the sort. Now, what would it look like if you didn't do the sort? What if you just said, okay, I'm going to iterate through the vertices in some order, and let me, in fact, let me sketch you a solution here. Let's say uh, we got some method paths of V, and we say if V is source, return one. Else, uh, let's loop over the, the predecessors and sum up. Now, I've got to, I'm trying to invent some notation here. Let's just do it this way. OK. 
Okay? Let's just write a recursion that way. So we say, if you want to know paths of V, well, first you check if V is a source. If it is, you return 1. Okay? Otherwise, you loop over all the predecessor vertices, call paths recursively, compute, uh, compute the number of ways to get to that vertex, and add it into P, and then return the total when you're done. So we're not ever looking up anything. We're just, every time we need something, we're just computing it. Would that work? Let's go back and see if it would, a direct recursion. Let's suppose we went to calculate paths of B. It would make two recursive calls, one to compute paths of A, which would be a, the base case, so it would return one, and then we would try to calculate paths of D. Well, instead of looking it up, because we know it's already been calculated, we'll just calculate it. So what would D do? It would, it would, call, cal, it would call paths of A and get a one from that, and then return one, and B would add the two things up. What can go wrong? Yes, you would eventually get the right answer, but what's the catch? Yeah? You recalculate the same vertex three or four times. Right. You may have noticed that I calculated A twice. Right? B made a recursive call to calculate paths of A and got an answer back. Then B called D. D called A. We did A twice. So you end up calculating things over and over again. Now, Let's suppose the graph looks like this. No, hold on here. I guess that's what I want. So I'm drawing the reverse of the graph here. So I'm saying that this vertex, these vertices depend on this vertex and so on. Okay, so when you go to compute this vertex, how many times does this one here get evaluated? Let's see. We're here, it's going to call up to that and over there, that's one. It's going to call up to that and over to there, that's two. Okay, what when you calculate this, how many times does this last one get recursively called? Now, let me back up here. Let's do this one here instead. Let's see, we go one, two, that's one way. Two. Oh, I'm, you can't see what I'm doing. We can go back that way. That's one way. We can have a chain of recursions like that. We can have a chain of recursions like this. And you can have a chain of recursions like that. So four. So you can con the, the point is you can construct a graph where calculating something way over here on the right ends up requiring like an exponential number of recursive calls at the other end. And suddenly, you got an exponential algorithm. The problem is, if you do it with recursion and you're not careful, you end up um, solving the same problem over and over and over and over again. And you run out of time. And there's a test case like that in the CATIS problem this week. It's structured pretty much like this thing I just drew, which is a real mess at this point. I apologize for that. But the, 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 um, you can see the genesis of the problem. Think about when you calculate F. Suppose you do it with recursive calls. Well, it's going to end up calculating A six times. Because the, the recursion is going to go back along one of these paths, and we know there's six paths back to A. So calculating F is going to involve calculating A six times. And it could get worse. But if you just topologically sort it and then apply a non-recursive algorithm like this. It just calculates the value for the vertex in terms of the previous calculated values of the predecessor vertices, your golden. And then this one here is very similar to the caddis problem. 
So the idea is that each vertex has a price labeled in white, and we're trying to calculate the cost, which is the, the biggest price we can reach from a given vertex. So what's the biggest price you can reach from F? Two. What's the biggest price you can reach from C? Six. What about from G? Two. What if we change this to a four right here? What would be the cost of G? Four. So what's the correct order in this case? To calculate the costs. Should we start to calculate the cost? The cost of U is just the price of U. And for a, for a sink. And the cost of U otherwise is the largest price of all the successors. Or, I'm sorry. The cost of U is either the price of U or the largest cost of all the successors. What direction does it make sense to work in? Should we work from the back to the beginning or from the beginning to the back? In reverse topological order or topological order? Yeah. Base case is in terms of the sink, so that's a clue right there. You work backwards. So you start at F and work backwards in topological order. And you know, when you need to calculate E, I'll show you here. You're guaranteed that the two successors have already been computed. C and G are already computed, so you take the max of those plus the max of one, and we get six. Then when we go to B, we take the max of six and the max of four, we go to D, we take the max of 6, 6, and 2. And for A, we take the max of 8, 6, and 6. We get 8. So don't just go straight to the CAS problem. Read the write-up I wrote in, in PS 4 or 5 because it explains the simplest way to do this is in reverse topological order. Um, you've got to come up with some non-recursive function that you can apply to each vertex in reverse topological order that will associate the right number with each vertex in the graph. And if you do that, it's not so hard. So do that. We're done.